Hello, my name is Tommy G. Kendrick. I am the producer and host of the Actors Talk podcast. Thank you for joining us for this very first Actors Talk podcast, Google Plus Hangout on Air. This Hangout on Air starred Benjamin Dane, Sean Johnson Jr., LaMarcus Tinker, and Christopher Sean Shaw. This great panel of independent filmmakers discussed their individual projects as well as a lot of different issues pertaining to indie filmmaking in general. I hope you find the video entertaining and informative. And please join me for a regular series of podcasts at actorstalkpodcast.com. This is a a very interesting process we're going to be going through tonight uh, for us here and for the audience watching uh, on the Internet. In case you're not familiar with what this all is about, this Google Plus, let me explain it a little bit. It's sort of like going back to the early days of television, quite frankly, when the technology was there and you could see the picture, but it wasn't necessarily the best it was going to be. It's certainly not the way it is now all these years later. And Google is constantly developing this Hangout and Hangout on-air technology. And it's such that we can present this to you tonight, but know that in a year from now it will be much better. And the implications for this are so really exciting for artists and filmmakers, I think. So if you guys out there are among the, those who are trying to produce your own films, Look at this as the possibilities for what it's going to be in the very near future, because I think it's going to be, um, I think it's going to be pretty exciting. A way to uh, gather not only with your creative teams, but also to share this kind of thing with a public audience. Whether it's if you if you have a film project and you have a celebrity you want to uh, present to the audience, or a casting session, or that kind of thing. There's all sorts of possibilities for this technology moving forward, and I think it's very exciting. I want to thank so much my panel of filmmakers here tonight. I've met uh, and talked with Benjamin Dane before. I've uh, talked briefly with Christopher the other night. We did a sort of a test uh, meeting, and that was great. I'm meeting LaMarcus for the first time tonight, and I've uh, interviewed uh, his uh, brother, Sean Johnson, previously for an episode of Actors Talk podcast. You can find those, and I, I actually interviewed Benjamin previously also, and you can find those interviews at actorstalkpodcast.com. Before we get into the specific projects, I'd like to talk to each of the guys and just get to know something about them and let you, the audience, know something about them. Um, and it's always of interest to me as a creative person because I know when I, I had yearnings as a young boy in Beaumont, Texas, that I somehow knew in my heart I wanted to be a performer, which was an unlikely uh, notion back then because I had no role models or anything and it always interests me to find out who among us uh, of of my creative peers and colleagues how this notion came to them that they wanted to get into the the creative arts somehow. Uh, Christopher tell me I'm gonna start with you if you don't mind because I I know the least about you really where did where did you grow up and and what what's your kind of your family background Do you have large family small family? Um, I grew up in a relatively small family. I had one brother. Um, I grew up in Plainfield, Ohio, which is in Coshocton County, and it's a small town. Now, when people usually say small town, they think, oh, what, like a few thousand people? No, it was like less than 200 people. So, very small town, and um, and um, ever since I was a little kid, I was uh, fascinated with uh, movies. Where did that come from? I mean, did you have a did you have a rich uncle who was in the movie business? Or, or, you know, <laughs> no. <laughs> if I did, we I might be. We all want I, that rich uncle. If I did, yes, I might be hitting going. him up for the youth group budget. Um, <laughs> no, um, no, I just um, I, you know, I saw movies when I was a kid, and actually, growing up, I really, really wanted to be a quote unquote movie star. So I really wanted to act, and I even went to college uh, for acting, but over the years I just found myself more and more behind the camera, and um, I really, really enjoy directing and creative producing. Well, when, when you were a kid, did you, uh, because you were more interested in acting, but were you making little films or, or holding uh, plays in the backyard or that kind of thing like a lot of, a lot of us did? Um, it started later for me, actually. Um, I didn't have like a Super 8 camera or anything like that. I got a 
a slim cam VHS uh, video camera when I was, I think, well, actually, my family got a video camera when I was in high school still, and then I got my own, I think, by the time I was a sophomore in college, if I remember right. So I did a bunch of little um, things with that, and I used to say, man, I wish I could be behind the camera and in front of the camera at the same time. <laughs> well, you could. You, you just had to be Jerry Lewis. <laughs> Which I'm well, actually, Ben Affleck just did that and got it well in Argo. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not it impossible. Worked pretty well for him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What, well, Christopher? What was the first uh, film project that you made, short film or whatever that that you you looked at and you went, you know what? I I like this. I think I have talent. Was it? Was there a time when that happened? That's a really good question. I would probably say. It may have happened before this, but the the first um, high quality one six eight film project that I did in twenty ten, um, where I was on set directing and people on the set knew me as a director, that's where it's. I think it really started hitting home. But I had ideas of being a director well, well before that. But I would say Skip Listening was probably the first short where it was, it was uh, solidifying more than normal. Really. So I mean that's fairly. What year was that? Because that's not that. That was in that was in 2010, oh. and I've and I've done a bunch of little goofy YouTube videos and stuff like that where I basically did it all: the camera, the acting, the editing, and all that stuff. And I really got a kick out of doing stuff like that. Um, so, but yeah, I think I think for that particular short, it was probably hitting home uh, more clearly. Um, that I, I really enjoyed being on a professional set directing. Cool. If you had to identify yourself as one thing and, and pick a, a discipline, if it was writing, directing, producing, could you do that? Or is there one that you'd say, yeah, you know, I, I could be happy if I only uh, wrote or if I only directed or which one if, if you could do that? If I had to pick just one, it would be directing. So you like to be in charge, buddy. <laughs> I'm friendly though. I, it's a <laughs> team. It's, wrong a, with that. it's a team <laughs> effort. <laughs> it's a team effort, exactly. I have evidence. my projects don't look as good as they do because of just me. It, it's 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 a total it team a collaboration. Yeah. You're a friendly guy. I have a photo I'm going to show in a moment that may just dispel that. So just. Oh. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to say we've been joined. Blackmail. By... Yeah, exactly. Public blackmail. Uh, yes. Johnson Jr. Sean, how are you? Can you hear me? Hi, how are you guys? Oh, good. Hello, hello. Good to see you all. Yes. Lamarcus, my brother. That's my brother, yes. <laughs> Tommy. It's, it's great to see you again. We had a little session the other night where we did a little bit of rehearsal, and it was actually my first time to do a face-to-face -face with Sean. We had a very, very good discussion a few months ago about a project that we'll be talking about called Down by the River. And uh, it, was, it was really nice to uh, get to talk to Sean in, in person the other night. And I'm uh, glad, glad you made it. I was, uh, I was concerned that you might not be here. But I'm, I'm yeah, sorry. I'm so sorry. I'll, I'll be live yet because um, I, we are live? Okay, good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> we are the live. Show. We are live. <laughs> <laughs> a cheeseburger or anything. <laughs> no product yeah. placement here, man. No. <laughs> John, since you came in last, I'll just go to you now. We're just sort of getting to know the filmmaker here before we start talking about projects. Now, I know a little bit about you because we talked before, but I, but I want you to introduce uh, yourself to the audience. And, and there are a couple of things. You have an, an interesting background, to be sure. And you were born in New Orleans, I believe. But yeah. you, you live now in Houston. And I'm, as I recall, maybe was that Katrina-related, the relocation from New Orleans to Houston or not? Am I um, same time, just the next year, the following year. I left in 06, so um, Katrina happened in 05. And then I uh, made the move to come to Houston, Texas. Now, when did you, you're a writer, you're an actor, and a really good actor. And the Thank thing you. the audience should know about all these guys, and this is not uncommon in the indie world, but these are what we would call hyphenates. There's uh, none of these guys are just an actor, just a writer, just a director, just a producer. They all wear uh, several different hats, and in these cases, they wear them well. So I know that uh, Sean is a writer, 
And I think that was probably it was acting or writing your first love that got you into this, this filmmaking world. Writing was my first love. Writing was my first love. I never knew um, that a screenwriter even existed until I did the research for myself in 05. And um, that's when I fell in love with the whole craft of filmmaking. And I thought it was extraordinary that people actually write lines for actors because I thought that actors came up with the stuff on their own. And um, I never knew about this, this world, the screenwriting world. That's it. Now, talk about your mom a little bit. Your mom is a pretty well-known writer, I understand, in, uh, especially in the New Orleans uh, area. And uh, I think she probably had an influence on, on you in terms of your creativity. Is that right? Yes. She had a, a, major, a major influence on me. Um, it wasn't a cool thing to do, per se, when I was growing up. And uh, my mom being What's a playwright. and mom's name? I'm sorry. Trina Brown. Her name's Trina Brown. And um, she started off in the playwright world, and um, I was too young to, to kind of get involved with the things that she was doing at the time. Um, I was like, you know, 10, 10, 11, 12 years old, and um, I helped around a lot, you know, going to different venues and prisons and churches and communities and, and uh, plays and all that good stuff. But she was the, the, uh, the, the, the solid foundation that, that laid the way for all of my brothers to do um, filmmaking. And now she's transferred into filming herself. So now was that um, was that a dream of hers, going back some years to get involved in film, or was that something? no? It, and and that's the weirdest thing. She she did. I guess she had an idea that she wanted to do it, but didn't know because she actually um, started taping her plays, and then she tried to take her plays and tape them herself, and then it was like we cut it on scene by like stopping and, th and then setting the camera and just starting it over again. And that's how we, you know, cut it on, on, on location. So, um, and that was, that was our first uh, project. I want to, I want to say it was called Christmas in the hood. And she took that play and they made it into a, a, a short film per se. Wow, that's, that's cool. and I, actually, I actually had a cool cameo. She, she you know, it was, it was kind of, I guess, ratchet back then how she did it. But, um, when she filmed one of the scenes, I was in the background with my feet hanging off the bed, you know, playing Madden in the background. So <laughs> that's where it started, my feet right there. <laughs> Is your mom involved with your creative endeavors, your your companies as you're producing films now? You and LaMarcus, I believe, are involved together in projects. Is she somehow involved in those projects as well? Yes, she's, she's majorly involved in me and LaMarcus projects and her projects. We all work as a, I guess, a three-horn team, and yeah. um, we just has a, as much, you know, opinion and uh, and, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? What what word I'm looking for, Mark? Is it the, uh, the input uh, and create? And, yeah, yes, and creative, creative advice. Input. She's very involved. Yeah, all the way, all the way. <laughs> so right now you're you're living you're still living in the Houston area, is that right? Yes, I'm 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 actually in Cypress off of two ninety and highway six. Uh, now don't give your address to Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta, you gotta catch me in traffic for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm gonna jump to the end of the line uh for the next talk to Ben. Benjamin Dane is uh is a guy that I've known uh, for a while now, just mainly because of a project that we'll be talking about here shortly beyond the farthest star. But Ben, tell us a little bit about your background, because as I recall from talking to you previously, really your, your entree into the arts wasn't in acting initially, wasn't it more in art or maybe graphic design or something like that? Or? Yeah, um, I kind of grew up more uh, uh, painting and illustration, really enjoyed drawing and, and, and all that, you know, just kind of the visual arts. And then, uh, you know, grew up in H-Town. That's Houston, so all right. for those that don't know. <laughs> so Houston's my, uh, my birthplace and um, my hometown. But, um, and I'm actually in Houston uh, tonight. So, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I grew up in Houston and just really doing – um, a lot of different things in the arts, uh, and, and I in, got introduced to acting in, um, in high school and just really fell in love with it, kind of left it, and then started doing um, stage shows, community theater, really kind of honing my craft that way, enjoyed it, uh, got an agent, and then started working um, 
in film and television and, and really fell in love with it. I, I love, as an actor, I really enjoy um, putting on the skin of someone else and really researching that character and, and finding out who that person is and, and, and really living that person. Um, and it's, that, to me, is a challenge, and it really is the joy of acting. But then I started, um, started producing. I met Andy Labrizi, um, who's the writer and director of Beyond the Farthest Star. I met him, um, and we produced our first film called Holding On, and that was done in the 90s. And it won some awards and did really well, and we screened it in AMC theaters in the Dallas area and sold out. I think four different theaters, um, and so it was. It's kind of a surprise, but we worked really hard. And this was before, really, um, films were independent. <laughs> you know, it it was kind of before all it started, and so that was kind of a neat thing that we were able to to work on that and and fulfill that dream. And um, but I love I love producing. I do. I love putting people together. I love the camaraderie, the, the brainstorming and, and coming together for one project and I think it's exciting, I think it's fulfilling and I love the, you know, really understanding the talents and the giftings of, of everyone involved. I think that's um, kind of the most interesting thing about producing and of course uh, getting the money is, is not the fun part <laughs> but yeah. it goes along with it and as you guys all know, yeah. the money, the distribution is probably the toughest two things you can always I mean anyone can do a film but um, you know uh, you, you want to do it with excellence and integrity but uh, the money and the distribution is is uh, two of the, the hardest uh, p uh, parts of the uh, process okay great we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit more now I want to I want to touch base with Lamarcus Tinker here I don't believe we we got to meet uh, Lamarcus Lamarcus now you you and Sean are brothers, but Sean, did you grow up in New Orleans, or, or is it a blended family, or did you grow up somewhere else, or how did that uh, come up come about in your childhood? Um, it is definitely a blended family. I actually grew up in the Houston, Texas area, um, and faith has it. I was introduced to Trina at the time, who's my mother, um, and we just became one big family, and it was all ordained by God, and one thing led to the next, and here we are. Man, that's that's awesome. Now, I want to I want to get a little bit of a story, but because people will know uh, Lamarcus probably more than any of us here, because he's having uh, quite an uh, excellent career as an actor. He's done many episodes of Friday Night Lights. I think he did like uh, if Google. I mean, if uh, IMDb is correct, and it may not be. I think they had you down for like 24 episodes of Friday Night Lights and a uh, number of episodes of Glee and. Uh, other series as well. So you're you're not only a working actor, but you're getting those gigs that uh, a lot of us would really love, which is multiple episode series regular type uh, gigs, and that's uh, you know that that's awesome. Tell us how you came to be cast in the TV show Friday Night Lights, because if if what I read in uh, the wiki article about you is accurate, this is a pretty interesting story. Can you can you briefly tell us that story? Yes, I definitely can. Uh, well, it's it was a it was 2009. Um, it was actually July, beginning of August. I was with some friends at the time, or actually, I, I apologize. I was actually in college at the time, um, at the university, and I came down to visit some friends. They heard about the show Friday Night Lights, and I had seen it in passing. I never watched it. Of course, I heard about the movie, and uh, they were like, "Oh, we're gonna go down and." We're going to audition to be background actors or what have you. So we all got in the car. Um, we all drove to Austin. They got out. They did their thing. They made a great impression. I didn't even uh, try to be involved or even go audition as they did uh, as far as background football players in the show. And one thing led to the next, and they actually got offered uh, the parts. And so they got them, and they were told they had to be in Austin on a 24-7 basis for several months. Um, as you know, a series shoot, usually six months long. And uh, so they got that offer. And at the time, like I said, I was in between college and visiting home. Well, one morning I woke up and I said, I'm not going to go back to school. And everybody was like, are you crazy? You know, I had an academic scholarship, so 
I was definitely on the right track there, and I decided to not go back. I said, you know, God spoke to me, and I said, I'm not going back. There's something greater for me. So at that time, we decided, okay, well, we're going to go. Well, we didn't have any money. Nobody had jobs. We were all, you know, I was in college. They were looking for work. So if you could imagine, you know, four or five guys together, we're not a dollar, you know, a nickel to rub together, uh, talking about going to Austin, of course, with no game plan because we had no place to live. We had no food to eat. I mean, we literally got on the Greyhound bus. It was $33. Never forget this. We all hustled up $33.54 bus <laughs> tickets to get on the Greyhound. Um, and we got on the Greyhound. And I said before we drove off, I said, you guys, you know, I'm not turning back. I have nothing to lose here. I'm going. And at the time, I was still not a part of the show. In no form or fashion, I was going to support them, but something was telling me, you should go, don't go back. And I said, okay, well, we're going to go. So everybody decided to go. Well, we get to Austin. Uh, we get off at the Greyhound. We actually go right around the corner to a Travel Lodge Hotel. Well, of course, none of us had money. And so if you could imagine these guys standing under this tree uh, with all their luggage, suitcase, pillows, laptops, the whole nine yards, we were literally <laughs> underneath the tree. It was hot outside. Uh, we, we, we just didn't know what we were going to do. So we were under that tree for about eight hours. Oh, man. Um, and something told me you know, to call uh, Laura Stokes, who was my former uh, theater teacher. And she's actually, she was also my former manager uh, at the time. I did hire her to work for me uh, once things did get started. Well, I called her. She had a friend there who was actually a high school teacher. He uh, drove over. He, he came to help us out. He had a flat tire on his way there, but he still came. And uh, he paid for two nights at the hotel. So we were like, thank you, thank you. We really appreciate it. <laughs> um, you know, then we were able to get some food. Let me, let me how, how did you get on Friday Night Lights? When you, when you got to the set uh, to, to, for the extra work, what, what happened? I mean, something, something happened. When uh, did you meet uh, somebody that said, hey, you look like a football yes. player? What? Yes, I actually was playing pool with a friend. And you know how guys are. We're macho. So I called out this gentleman who looked like a regular crew guy. Uh, he really didn't look like he would really wanted to be there. But I think it was because he was into the game he was playing. So I called him. I said, I'm going to play you. Well, little did I know, that guy uh, just so happened to be the executive producer, creator, and director of Friday Night Lights, Peter Berg. Oh my, oh my and, gosh. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, That's he, crazy. Yes, he told me, he said, All right, I'll play you. And so he went, he had a little boy with him. I assume that was his son. He uh, had a little boy with him. And then he comes back over. He's like, All right, I'm going to play. So everybody starts crowding the table. He beats me in the matter of seconds. <laughs> like, I could not believe. I was like, Did this guy just hustle me? Um, and so we. At that time, the extras were supposed to go to set. Well, at that time, I was asked, well, why don't you just be an extra? I said, okay, cool, no problem. No problem. Make some extra change while I'm there supporting the friends. Well, one thing led to the other, and I'm walking on set. This, he calls me back over. He's like, there's something about you that I like and that I love. It's something telling me to you do something with you. And he asked, you know, was I an actor? I said, yes. He says, are you serious about this business? I said, yes. He said, okay, well, this is what you're going to do. You're going to go in that scene. You're going to say this. You're going to talk to this person. And this is how it's going to go. And I said, okay. He asked, what is your name? I said, LaMarcus Tinker. He said, Tinker, I like that. That's your character's name. Thank you. And then next thing I know, <laughs> he's, you know, everybody's surrounding me. And they're like, hey, you know, this is what you need to do. I'm signing this. I'm giving this. I'm putting this on. I'm getting spritzed by makeup and hair and wardrobe. Wow. So, so many things are going on. Well, Long story short, that happened. I showed back up thinking, okay, that was great. Everybody was – it was the first day of shooting of season four, the very first day. Um, and that first scene was with Taylor Kitsch and Madison Burge. Um, and I showed back up thinking, okay, I'm just going to go back to being an extra. You know, that was great. Uh, well, little did I know that wasn't going to happen. Um, I was actually told uh, you cannot be an extra anymore and you shouldn't have showed up today. And so I was kind of like, whoa, what did I do? And so I'm sitting in the cafeteria area. He walks by. He comes over. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, they told me I couldn't work. He was like, who told you that? Um, and let's just say things change very quickly. Um, and then the next day I came back on set, 
um, I had a trailer, I had a deal, and I had a script where my character was created, and that's hence the, that's how Dallas Tinker was created. I was written into the show. Um, the executives and you know and the writers loved me, and they changed my life overnight. So I went from underneath that tree to a deal with the studio within a week, you know, and sorry. my life changed forever after at that point. I'm sorry I got you to tell that story. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a God thing right there, man. Yeah, that, that was is amazing. Blessing. That, that was that nothing but story. God. It was ordained. Wow. Uh, and I'm glad I listened that morning when I woke up out of my sleep. There's going to be all these people that see that and go, see, all I need is it going to happen for me. The same. Uh, it does yeah. happen. <laughs> yes, it, does. it was a blessing. Very rare. And uh, in, in Lamarcus' viewpoint, and, and he way may well be right it was ordained so and, and unless the lord's looking over your shoulder like he was for him you know don't try this at home it may not happen <laughs> right follow your dreams but you know have a plan because i really took a leap on faith there and it could have all fallen apart but it didn't i listened i was obedient um and here i am today that's mm. that's awesome that's a that is a that is a great uh, great story and and this whole Thing that we're involved in this filmmaking, whether it's acting or, or uh, producing films or movies, there's there's so much faith involved, and there has to be a lot of passion involved as well. I mean, I tell people all the time I get uh, through the podcast and in uh, my blog and stuff, I get young people, and everybody's younger than me now. Uh, but uh, I get people calling, say, or contacting me, saying, "What what can I do?" And I and you know, I really have to tell people honestly. Unless you feel it's a calling, you know, I mean, a, a deep, even a spiritual calling, you know, not just something I want to do or I think I'd like to do it. If it's not really deep within you, do something else. Yes. yes. Because the business is very, very hard. It's, it's rough. Overnight. Producing movies takes years sometimes to get one movie yes. done. It takes years to create a, an acting career. You're, you know, you're off to a great start, but it's so rare to have someone to have the kind of success you've had so quickly yeah, you know if it's not something that you must do because it's in your soul do something else because there are a lot easier ways to make a to make a living that's for absolutely sure. that's it needs to be that purpose uh, I want to uh, now we're gonna try something audience and we're gonna we're gonna switch to what's called an app here and I'm gonna share my screen and show some show some uh, pictures of some different films we're gonna talk about and I'm hoping that this doesn't create havoc in the hangout. <laughs> Not Pro Tools. Not Pro Tools. Oh, no. No. Here we go. Not, not Pro Studio, but I'm going to go to a no. screen share and uh, and hopefully, you know, because I stayed up till 2 o'clock getting these slides ready. I'm going to use You're them. You're going to try. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going we're gonna to try it and hopefully, I'm going to start, uh, Ben, I'm going to start with you and we'll talk about uh, Beyond the Farthest Star. And, I, and if you will, I'm going to put some of these uh, photos up, and maybe you can just uh, take that opportunity to not only talk about the specific photo, but if, if it, it recalls or brings something to mind about the project, then you can go into it at that time. Does that sound fair? That That's sounds it. great. Okay, let's try this, guys. Oh, boy. Let me uh, – this is, this is live. Live television, folks. So I'm going <laughs> to switch something over here and see if I can get started. There we go. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. There we go. Please stay with me, everyone. Okay, Ben, can you see that? And hopefully, yes. This is our uh, brand new logo and new colors that we just released. Um, I think it was December 31st. So this is our new look for the film that we'll be releasing uh, this year in theaters in 2013. Cool. I want to see it. They look good. Yeah, I want to see it as well. Somehow I need to, you know, I haven't figured out uh, how to make these slides stay up when we talk. So hopefully, um, hopefully everybody can hear me now, and hopefully I can make the slides uh, stay up uh, so that everybody can see it. So let's go on to the next one. And, okay. Nice to have. We, have, we have an incredible cast, um, and, and one of our stars is Renee O'Connor. Renee was in... Um, uh, she was Gabri Gabrielle and Zena, and an incredible actress. And I'm just so excited because I can't wait for people to see her in this role. She's so amazing in this role, 
And I don't think anyone has ever seen this side of Renee. She's a tremendous actress, and we're very uh, privileged and honored to have her in, in this role as Maureen O'Connor. I'm sorry, Maureen Wells. <laughs> it just so <laughs> happens that O'Connor O'Connor is her maiden name, and it's also it's 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 strange because it was written as Maureen O'Connor and as her maiden name, and and of course it's Renee O'Connor. So that was not planned. So that, oh, wow. <laughs> but uh, it, she's married to uh, Adam Wells in the in the film, so she's Maureen um, Wells. Okay, now a lot of people know her from the Xena. TV mm -hmm. show. That's where she, where they would they would know her. Maybe originally, she's done a tremendous amount of work uh, in the business. How how did you how were you able to get her involved in your project? Because apparently, you guys you guys have more. I mean, you had a fair amount for a budget. If you're getting some pretty significant names in your project, how did you get her involved? Um, you know, it was really interesting. We um, had uh, a casting director friend of mine, uh, Karen Armstrong. Um, who is a LA casting director, and she's worked with um, gosh, so many different people. She did um, um, a lot of films, and 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 has worked in television. And she was able to do casting there in Los Angeles, and we were doing casting in Texas for our local cast. And we, of course, had the opportunity to bring in a few stars and a few uh, names and. Renee was one of them, and she read the script, and she loved it so much. She, uh, one of the things she came in when we met her in Los Angeles, she was crying, and she said, "Oh my gosh, this script is so incredible! I've never read a role like it." And she, um, she says she related so well to the part, and you know, we were just taken by her from the very beginning, and um, you know, it's 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 interesting because for me, on the other side of the camera, when you're when you're talking with fellow actors and you're having to cast them in, in roles, um, you have such a deep sense of belonging with them and compassion for them. And it was really unique to see and I think Andy and I really enjoyed her take on the role and what she brought to the role, uh, you know, eventually. Well, let me ask you, Ben, this, your, your film is, I believe, would be at least partially to the genre of, of let's call it a faith-based film, I'm not sure you know, what the proper terminology should be anymore. And uh, Renee is not necessarily known as an actress who, uh, well, let's put it this way. A lot of times in the faith-based market, you have certain actors and actresses who go from project to project within that realm, but she's not necessarily one of those actors. So it says something to me that maybe your script is really good. Uh, if it tra attracted a mainstream actor, or a secular actor to the project was it was it seems like it was the role that attracted her she she loved the role she loved the script and you know that was one of the things you know that you know everything begins from the script you guys I mean it really does you've got to have a powerful script you've got to have a strong story and Andy is an amazing writer he he did such a tremendous job on the the screenplay that people were so attracted to it and when they read it, and you know, we met with a lot of name talent that fell in love with the project because they read the screenplay first. Um, we also, um, you know, Lou Beatty Jr. there behind Todd. Uh, Todd plays Adam Wells, and you see Lou Beatty. Lou Beatty, um, he's very familiar to a lot of people. He's been on national commercials. He's just he was just in a big commercial that that ran for several months, but he was on Fast and Furious with Vin Diesel and Paul Walker. Uh, he's been on numerous television shows, um, but an incredible actor. And I think when your story is good, when your screenplay is good, it's going to attract great talent. And that's what you want. You want people that are going to love your project and believe in your project and go with you through this journey together. And you want those people. You want talented actors, whether it be someone that's, that's up and coming or it is a star, you want them to be involved in your project and uh, be all in. Uh, so we had these tremendous actors. Todd was a local actor in Texas, but Todd himself, uh, he's done, I mean, he's had a recurring role on Breaking Bad. Um, he, was, uh, he was in um, Arlington Road with Tim Robbins and just an incredible stellar career already for a Texas actor. 
So we, we were able to attract a lot of these people really because of the screenplay. And then we were able to get a novel written. Um, the authors, Bodie and Brock Taney, came on board because of the screenplay. They loved the story. Wow. So that's, uh, I guess that's the benefit of, if people are trying to decide, uh, young filmmakers out there, you know, should we do our film non-union or SAG? One of the benefits of doing it as, as a, a guild signatory project is that you can attract some of the talent like we're seeing here who would be uh, SAG after members. Exactly. SAG after is it, it, it means it defines professional actors, and um, non-union is considered more amateur actors because those actors have worked very hard to get to where they are. Yeah. And you know you are going to be able to uh, attract uh, named talent and people that really you know there's a lot of stars out there that will work for less money because they want to kind of get break out. They want to do something different than than you know you see Jim Carrey who's known for his comedy. He wants to test the water and he wants to do some more dramatic stuff. So there are a lot of people out there that you might have access to uh, because of that. Right. Um, Sherry Lee, amazing talent. Sherry Lee um, is the narrator. She narrates the film and Sherry has done over 50 different anime voices, and she's been in um, Fast Food Nation, Friday Night Lights. Um, Sherry is now in Los Angeles and is a tremendous talent. This film is going to do a lot for her career because it really showcases her. And then we had the opportunity of working with Andrew Prine. Um, Andrew is an amazing actor and has been in, I don't know, 75 different films. Um, he his I think his first film was um, Miracle Worker with Patty Duke and Anne Bancroft is he's worked with everybody in Hollywood um, and then Barry Corbin who is on Anger Management right now and uh, No Country for Old Men Northern Exposure and uh, Barry plays our uh, police chief in the town and tremendous tremendous talent um, so these are the people that we were able to get and and really like I said because of the story they loved it. And um, it really pays off in the final product. Let me ask you another thing: Are these frame grabs that we're seeing here? Yep, these are actual. Um, these are taken from the footage of the film. Um, we shot on the red camera, okay. and so there's a lot of detail you'll see in in these graphics and in the, the photographs. But they're actually frame captures. Yes. That's awesome. And who was your DP? Because the the lighting and everything in here is really excellent. Run Gonzalez um, was our DP. And he did a great job. Yeah, it's really, really good looking stuff here. It is. What, uh, what kind of a shooting schedule were you guys on? How many weeks? We were on, you know, um, as you guys know, independent film is always tight on the budget. So um, we had a four week, uh, we worked uh, five days, one, or, I'm sorry, six days, one day off. And we did that for four weeks. We shot three weeks in Leonard, Texas, where we did all of our location shooting there, and um, it's a huge, huge portion of the film. And then we shot a week in Dallas. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's some awesome stuff. Is there is there anything else you? Uh, we'll talk some more about it before we wrap up. But is there anything else you wanted to mention about uh, the film? Uh, any any screenings going? You, I know you've had some test screenings. How have those gone? We've had several test screenings. Um, we've had, I think, four to f four different test screenings. The audiences, we, we've posted them on Facebook. Facebook, uh, I think it's facebook.com slash uh, Beyond the Farthest Star. We really have tried to get the fans involved in the film and the process of making the film. And now that we're, we're almost finished, we uh, have been having screenings where we're doing test audience we actually, because of the test audience, we actually went back and did some pickup shots and changed a few things in the film because um, of a few comments. And I think that's a great thing, too, for any filmmaker to do is to have some test screenings of your rough edit so you get an idea. Is it communicating to your audience? So I think the film's going to be even better because of that. But um, we're planning to release in 2013. And... Um, I know our fans have been anxiously awaiting. Um, it's been a long process. And independent film is tough because it takes a lot of time. We don't have the millions and millions of dollars that uh, the studio films have, and they're produced so quickly. But uh, we'll be releasing um, our trailer in the coming weeks, and we'll have a countdown to the trailer. So it's very, and it's, it's, 
I can't wait. It's it's going to be so good. It looks but good. Um, but yeah, it well it really looks good. As you've got a great cast, and um, well the the tech work on it looks uh, exceptional. And I, I look forward to seeing it. We'll talk about it some more. Let's move on, though. Now, I want to talk about a couple of projects that LaMarcus and Sean are involved with. Uh, the, the newest one, or the one that's in, uh, I guess, funding stages or maybe pre-production is 400. And then we'll also talk about a completed film you guys have called Down by the River. Let me see if I can get going in the right direction here. There we go. Oh, I love this. Uh, I love this shot. Is that... Do you think that may uh, continue? I know there's an alternate. We'll show that in a minute. Um, I just really like that that picture. Where where what? How do you feel about it, Sean? Um, I like it. I like it. We uh, did some uh, some heavy photoshopping on this bed, but we have some some better ones now. You know, it's uh, the the only thing I would say about this, and and it, it's not a negative to me, but it it has a period look to it. Ah, oh, yeah. Because of the muted colors. In fact, I was—I think I was telling Ben the other night. I was when I got when I saw this. I said, man, I really like that. And I went and picked up some of my old baseball cards. Uh, and the, and the color mm -hmm. scheme in the in the baseball cards, you know, is is very similar to that. And I thought, well, I wasn't sure if it had a uh, some sort of a retro. Right. Uh, it was. It's definitely a vintage shot. look. Yeah. Yeah, but but it's a really cool shot. And then here's a here's an alternate. Uh, so I'm guessing this film is about track in some way. Tell us about what. Tell us basically the thumbnail story of what 400 is about. Yeah, 400 is um. Well, first of all, in high school, I ran track. I ran track and field, and um, my event was the 400. Okay. And and um, in high school, they had a friend of mine named um, Jerome, and this this kid was was um, phenomenal. He was he was like a. If you if you would if you would say anyone that would you know qualify to be in Beijing or something, this kid was on his way, wow. and um, he had a freak accident. And when he had his freak accident, he he tore his um, his fibula in, in his foot. I mean his ankle. I'm sorry. And, and when it happened, you know all the calls stopped. You know everything kind of stopped for the kid, and, and and you know his life turned dramatically. And so um, for my second film, I kind of wanted to tell that story. And uh, make it into a movie, and um, use some of those same, you know, events that happened, um, you know, that was just given as as a storyline, you know. And so um, this kid, his name is Noah, and um, Noah is a kid that's coming out of high school, and uh, the kid can't lose a race, and and he's just a phenomenal uh, talent. And his best friend, which is played by Lamarcus Tinka, his co-star. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that that yeah, guy. Right there. Yeah. That? That's it. <laughs> so, um, you know, they uh, they always experiment on, on how fast he could possibly go, and um, just just being that dynamic um, athlete. And when his kid is growing up, he gets the opportunity to go into um, collegiate level with his with his athletic skills, and he's he goes to um, you know a predominant school that that that's run by track and field. And he gets the opportunity to be trained at the legendary coach, and his name is Coach Bo. And um, when he gets there, he realizes that his talent is not enough. His talent is is just a mere piece of what you need to become, you know, a team player and a, and a, just a better person. So uh, as he gets this opportunity to go to college and runs, you know, just a phenomenal races, um, at what cost, you know, do he learn, you know, to become – who he needs to be and that's the ultimate goal for this guy right here is to become that 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 athlete that 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 learns how to help everyone i'm just checking to see if we have any uh comments going on i'm not i'm not finding i'm sorry i'm not I'm listening to you but i wanted to see if we could locate any comments or questions from the audience so i want to remind the audience if you do have uh, if, if if there is an audience watching and uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, send those into us, and we're trying to locate them. This this process of trying to wrangle these comments is not the easiest thing in the world. Well, let me ask you, Sean and and Lamarcus, how long did it? How long does it did it take you to write this script? I know you told me on on Down by the River you wrote that fairly quickly. It sounds like the story's been brewing in your head for a number of years. Uh, right. Once, once you sat down to write it, did it come fairly quickly? 
or was it a well? You know, how how did that happen for you? Um, I think this is an interesting story about how I came in with the screenplay. I found out that well, I heard a rumor that Sylvester Stallone wrote Rocky in three days in seventy two hours, and um, when I found it out, I, I kind of pushed myself to see how fast that I could do it. And so, with the help of a twenty four pack of Pepsi, and, uh, <laughs> no product placement, no, no product placement. Yeah. Okay, with with uh, some soda pop. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Twenty four pack of soda pop. I said, well let's 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 push the limit. If we're gonna and do that it has to be key. Y E one hundred percent through New Zealand spring water because they've sponsored my podcast. Okay, oh, that, there we go. Man. Only water. There it is. And um so, I, so you wrote it that quickly? Yeah, I wrote it in sixty one hours. Oh my god. Wow. I wrote that screenplay wow. in sixty one hours the first now, draft. If you read this screenplay, are we gonna say that reads like it was written in sixty one no. hours? No. <laughs> no. No, no. Lamarcus, no. spill it. No. no. <laughs> okay, Lamarcus, I want you to tell tell me about Sean. What's what are his strengths as a writer? His ability to captivate an audience. He takes you on a journey. Uh, he really uh, introduces you to these characters in a very slow fashion to where you start to feel for them. Uh, you may love them. You may hate them. You may be caught in the middle uh, where you want to root for them, but then you feel like uh, maybe they're not doing too much you know, for themselves. And so his writing is very brilliant. That's one thing that, that I can really say about him. He is an amazing writer. I've read a lot of scripts uh, from some of the best writers there are in the business. Uh, and, and this my brother right here is one of those writers. Um, and that's why I get behind him and give him my full support. Wow. Well, wow. That's, that's quite an endorsement. Now, now let, let's turn about fair play. Sean, if, if, uh, what is, what are Lamar, other than acting, what are LaMarcus's strong suits that he brings to your production company? Is it in the, is it in the area of directing or producing or what, uh, what do you go to turn to him for and say, man, I need my brother on this one. Uh, Okay. I would I would say Lamarcus is a very talented actor, but his business skills at the at the age that Lamarcus, you're what, twenty one right now, right? Twenty two. Okay, twenty two. This kid is like <laughs> Whoa. I'm not kid, but don't get me wrong, I'm sorry, in, in age wise. Well, you're the older brother? Yeah. <laughs> he would the way he thinks and the way that he conducts business, you would think he's been doing it for 40 years and everyone that been around us and been around LaMarcus they will tell you that this he's so brilliant in getting things organized and getting things running and I mean he would it's hard for me to explain it you would have to see it in person the way he conducts it and the way he runs the ship it's 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 far none of anyone I've I've ever, I've ever met he would go with you to to to, to through, through great measure, just to see anything done or get anything, uh, make anything successful. I never seen him take a break. If you'd be like, hey, Lamarcus, you, what you think? You know, can we rewrite this? Can we do this? He would be there every single step of the way. Every single step of the way. Sometimes he step ahead of you. <laughs> no, one of the, one of the, what comes out in all these stories is number one, passion. I'll go back to passion. But the other thing is when you're talking about making films, man, you hit on something that's so key and that's organization. Yeah. Time yes. it's money. And, um, boy, it, it, whether you're directing or producing, you've got to be organized. And, and for the filmmakers out there, that, that means all the paperwork that you don't want to do. It's mm. got to be done because yes. if it gets to the end of the line and you get a distributor interested and you don't have all those releases signed along the way and things like that, and you don't have a proper chain of title and you don't have someone that was ramrodding all that and organizing all that material, you could really sabotage your own project. So that organization, those organization skills, uh, in addition to the passion, are really, really key. Um, what's this slide here, guys, that, that's up? That's the um, that's a still image from when we were shooting um, the teaser for 400, yes. and at that moment um, we had a, a director photographer to come out, which is William Molina. That's the same guy who shot down by the river as yeah, the director. Too, yeah. And um, I think he was taking a, a look at the image that he was he was looking for to do the visuals. And at that moment, it was like what 30 degrees out there, so I was freezing. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> 
I love this poster for Down by the River. Tell us briefly, because we're we're sort of getting long on time. I don't want to. I want to. Uh, you know, don't go too long, but I do want to get everybody and get you to talk about your projects. Down by the river, I, you know, I've only seen the trailer that was up on uh, Facebook, I guess. I know the film has been completed. It has gone out to at least, I know it's played a festival in San Antonio, and I believe you're in discussions for distribution now, if I'm not wrong. But tell me about the film a little bit. I love, this poster is so evocative. I, just, I really like it. Uh, tell us about the film a little bit. Well, Down by the River was about um, a, a, a young man who was, a, um, he worked as a mechanic at a mechanic shop, and his sister was suffering through a disease called sickle cell anemia, which is uh, very popular in the African-American community. And um, this disease is very life-threatening and, and life-dangering. And my, si my actual sister had um, sickle cell disease. And so she passed, I want to say, in 2006, and she was only four years old, and she had a you know a, um, a complication. God, I'm 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 starting to get emotional again, but um she she had some complications um, with her sickle cell anemia disease, and it took her life at a very young age, and she couldn't even live to see five. So what I wanted to do was, I wanted to keep our story to live forever. Well, we all want, we all wanted that, and um, so he ended up. Everything that I wanted to, you know, share with my sister, I, I, I figured, well, if we, if we turn this into a screenplay, then maybe I could do some of the things that I would like to do, and now I could watch that, you know, forever. And so that's what we did. And um, so the movie is about her, you know, suffering through a sickle cell disease, and he tell us stories um, just to kind of brighten up our day. But on the side, the, uh, the, the character, he wants to be an author, and he has no way of finding that, you know, the right way to write, you know, he, he's struggling, but little did he know the stories that he told Hannah was the stories that would help him become that author one day. That's great. Tell me about the, tell me about the little girl you found to, to play in, in the movie and how you located her. Um, Adriana Foley, um, she came to audition. She came to audition with her mom and she sat there and, and, and me, LaMarcus and William and my mom, Trina, and, and we just sat there and just watched it. She just blew us away. Like with everything that she did was it was just perfect and phenomenal. And I was like, wow, like where did she come from? And um, we signed her that day. You know, we did the paperwork and we got her aboard. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure she does a great job. She did, certainly did a great job in, in the trailer. How did the um... – now, Lamarcus, were you you were a producer or executive producer or both on the show? This looks like this was from uh, Down by the River. I'm assuming this is production still. Yes, that's correct. I uh, was executive producer on Down by the River. Okay. Were you there the whole shoot? Or I was there every single day. Now, what's going um, I, except for uh, I was there every single day except for when I had to fly out to film in Los Angeles. Um, I think it was maybe a maybe two or three scenes that I missed out on, but other than that, I was there all the time. What's going on in this shot? Are you guys conferring on how to play a scene? Or uh, Well, what's happening right here, this is actually one of the most intense scenes in Down by the River. This is after Hannah has passed away, um, and this is where uh, Sean's uh, character is in a depressed state. He really is lost. He's given up all hope. Um, you know, his lifeline was Hannah. After working, he loved his family. Uh, he cared for his family. And so she just passed away. And so we're sitting here actually getting in the zone and talking um, about what's getting ready mm -hmm. to take place. As you can see, we cleared the room um, so we could have that one-on-one -on -one talk uh, to really go there. Because as an actor, um, you have to go to places sometimes that you're not used to and you have to bring up old pains and things of that nature and so you have to be really careful um, on how deep you go uh, because it's hard to really get out of that mindset once you're there um, and so that's what we were doing right there in that scene. So it sounds like you were in addition to producing you're you're almost working in a directorial uh... Yes, I, 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 I was assistant director on there as well so I did multiple things on that film as well. Right. What uh, what kind of I see uh, looks like a DSLR. So you you shot on a DSLR for this film, is that right? Yes, the seven D and five D. Okay, and as I recall from our former conversation, uh, Sean, I, I believe you said you were you guys were 
uh, fortunate enough to get some really good Canon glass to shoot with. So, I mean, your images look really good in the film. So. Yeah, yeah, we did. We had some some powerful L L series lenses, and some seventy to two hundred millimeters, and some some hundred macros, and Absolutely. and all that good stuff. Now, will you shoot four hundred in the same way, or will you move up to a different uh, uh, to a red or some other camera, or do you know yet? We are working on a red. We're yeah, working on the red camera, yeah. Benjamin, send that red, man. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Benjamin, what's up? I have a couple of DPs I can send your way that have their red camera. Okay. Nice. Awesome. There you go. That's great. Well, well, let me see what's what's next here. Oh, yeah, okay. Here's a, tell me about this. What's going on here? Uh, right here, um, the family is actually having uh, dinner here. And what's happened is Sean has just come home from work, actually working a long day at the mechanic shop. He comes home, uh, he's expecting to eat. Well, however, uh, sitting at the table, and you can't see him in this photo, is an amazing actor uh, named Benny Schwartz, who played the father of Hannah. Uh, and her father kind of comes in and out of her life, and him and Sean have never seen eye to eye. And so they're actually eating, and Hannah, uh, she really doesn't like to eat greens, um, and they don't usually make her do it. Um, and so her father becomes really upset with her, you know, and tells her, you know, you do what I say type of mentality, and it really upsets everyone, and it's like complete silence, and as you can see, Adriana uh, there is really, she's really down about it, because she really loves her dad, and she never wants to upset him, because she feels yeah. like she's the reason he leaves. Yeah. How long a production schedule did you guys have on this film? Oh, we shot on and off for about a good, I want to say a year and a half, maybe two years, simply because of scheduling. Uh, everyone was doing different things, uh, and we did start off initially shooting two weeks straight. You're talking 12, maybe 15-hour days um, at the time, and so we shot for a while. It took us about a good year and a half, two years to get everything completed, post-production, and, of course, the premieres that we did. Wow. We're going to talk to Christopher in a minute, but let's explore that just for a second while we're, while we're talking about it. Because uh, I know, Ben, you're, you shot or began production on uh, Beyond the Farthest Star in, what, 2009? Uh, we shot principal photography in 2010 was our main, um, you know, for four weeks, the principal photography in March of 2010. Right. And, and you guys, so, so the point is that a lot of times people, especially in the indie realm, uh, maybe fans or people who are looking for a film don't understand how long it takes to get a film made, and they may think, "Oh, well, something's wrong with the film. It did, you know, it must not be any good, or something like that." And that's not the case at all. No. You have millions of dollars to throw at something and can keep on on a really quick release schedule. A lot of times, you you in the indie world, you have to do what you can do as you can do it and get the film together. Um, well, you, know, you don't. I think most most people think. I, I think that uh, when they see these big films come out and they come out really quickly, they've got you know the studios prepare for them. They're they've got this huge marketing campaign behind them. What people don't understand is those movies. You know, they spend. You know, they 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 just spend a hundred million dollars on the production alone, and then they spend you know at least fifty, sixty, eighty million dollars. On P and A, on on uh, prints and advertising, mm -hmm. so that's the kind of money we don't have. <laughs> you know, we just don't have that. I mean, I wish we did have that rich uncle, but yeah. we don't. Yeah. You know, so it takes some time to put things together. But I will tell you, the independent, the people that work in independent film are so committed, and it's like a family. And so, you know, they're all hard workers, and you've got people that are so ready and willing to do just about anything to get this film completed. It just takes a little bit longer to do it because we don't have the, uh, the, the money that the studio has. We've got we to operate on a very shoestring budget. You know, I think I was talking to Ben about this the other night. And Christopher, you could jump in here too if you have any, a viewpoint on any of these issues. I'm going to talk to you about your films here in just a second. But, you know, I was, I was talking to, I think it was Ben we were talking uh, there's some really uh, well-known movies, or pretty well-known movies anyway. I would, uh, I, the last thing I was in was a little movie called Bernie with Jack Black and, and Shirley MacLaine and Matthew McConaughey. And That's a and, great movie. Thank you. Yeah, and, and it took a decade to get made. And here, you know, Rick, Richard Linklater is a name indie director, certainly. 
uh, but he's done mainstream things too, but main, mainly indie. But he wrote the script, I think, almost 10 years ago, and he's been waiting for the right cast and everything. And then even with Jack Black and Matthew McConaughey and Shirley MacLaine, a release wasn't assured. They had, you know, they had to get it to the right people who saw how good the movie was and believed in it to uh, to get the right uh, release uh, going on it, right distribution. So it's not just, uh, I mean, it 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 takes a long time. And one other anecdotal thing from my own experience, I was in a a little a great little family film back in 1997, I guess we shot called uh, an independent film called Dancer Texas Population 81. And that script sat around for 10 years while the director and writer Tim McCandless, you know, went about trying to to raise the money. And then he went on and did secondhand lions and some other things too. But uh, you know, it it you know, it seems like almost sometimes the better the film, the longer it takes to get it made. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, American Beauty, I think, took 18 years to complete, and yeah. that was just. I think whenever a, a, here's the thing, studios. And distributors, they don't, they they see a project and they think automatically it's going to be kind of a risky project if it's not a horror movie, if it's not a romantic comedy, if it's not kind of a, a superhero movie, if it's not one of those movies that always sell and always do well. You know, it, it's you know, it's a tight economy, so they're going to be yeah. looking at the risk factor, and so yeah, it may take a little bit longer to to sell a movie to someone, to get them excited about it. Right. Yeah, it's just... Well, a, especially in this market. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, that's right. The economy has a big, has a lot to do that with that. And, and, and even tax laws. Fortunately, cool. you know, the, with the, uh, the, the favorable tax situation with the, what is it, a, a 181? I uh, can't remember the, the name of the Section part. 181. Section 181. Section got extended, you know, and that's something that's favorable for film investors. So Absolutely. It, it really helps when those tax incentives are there uh, when you're making a film. You know, and then the other thing, when we talk about incentives, uh, and we're dealing with this in Texas and, and even California, everywhere is dealing with it, and that's the, the tax incentives that the states are offering to certain locations to get film production there. Louisiana has... Uh, by and large, decimated the Texas market in some ways, and we're trying to win it back by increasing our more, being more competitive with tax incentives. But there's so much production in Louisiana now, film production, because they have a very strong uh, tax incentive program, and because it's been so strong now for a few years, the infrastructure is building up there as well. Um, so it's uh, you know it's a lot. And, and, every, and, and states compete for that because Georgia's doing really well. I think the Carolinas are doing well. Mm -hmm. You know, and they all have Oklahoma, and New Mexico. They all have their incentives, and it, it's great because uh, it gives you know uh, a smaller film the opportunity to, to to go to a state and really do more for their their money than they would normally but you know it's it's kind of funny because Louis, uh, California is doing less and less you know it's like all the films and even the series are leaving California and doing them on location in other states right. that have incentives yeah yeah I mean tax to California just I think they I think they got their own tax incentive package re uh, re upped again, but you know the the economy there is in in s such bad shape. It's it's difficult, but you know there there really is. I mean, I think for the last like three of the four last auditions I've had, I've taped the auditions for New Mexico and Atlanta and maybe uh, New Orleans or somewhere. So you know that's what's happening in the actors' world too. This this everything the pr uh, production's spreading out. So. Christopher, let's talk about some of your projects. I, I love this poster, and one of the projects we want to talk about is sort of a mock-up here, but uh, that we want to talk about is this film, Youth Group. Tell me, tell me about that film and uh, that project. It, it hasn't been shot yet, I don't think, and sure. how you came to be associated with it. Uh, that's a really interesting story. I actually met Thor Ramsey, who's the writer and he's to star in it as well, um, he's a Christian comedian and he's a teaching pastor at Canyon Lake Community Church now. But um, he wrote the script before I even knew him. And uh, I met him on Facebook. And a very long story short, um, I invited him to come on my 2010 168 film project, uh, which turned out to be Skip Listening that he also wrote and was the star of. 
And um, part of the reason that he um, came on board on our team to do that was because he had ulterior motives to find filmmakers to get youth group made. Uh -huh. So um, so we talked about that, of course, during the process of uh, working on Skip Listening. And uh, the story, it's about a youth pastor in crisis, and it's a romantic comedy, satire. The satire part is it takes a comical, lighthearted look at some of the wacky methodologies and strategies in churches today, and um, and uh, and it also has a very redemptive uh, message in it uh, at the end that uh, plays really well in the, in the screenplay. I, I love the I love the tagline at the, <laughs> at the top, and hopefully people can see it. It says, "Who's who says Christians aren't funny? Christians have always been funny, just not on purpose." <laughs> 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 very true. Uh, yeah. You know, when you look at the faith-based market, unless I'm wrong, I don't see, especially in the features, I don't see that many comedies. You know, not at all. Yeah, I, it's I see it's a usually, lot of, I mean, a lot no of, offense to anybody, but it's usually a lot of crying. Yeah, <laughs> so, I, uh, yeah. you know, the the hallmark and, and and the downside of the genre, unfortunately, for so long, has been that the films just weren't in in the faith-based market, just weren't very good movies. I mean, they might have been technically somewhat proficient, but the acting, uh, the hallmark of right, a, right. a, a quote-unquote Christian film is usually the acting's bad, uh, the technical work is not that good, and there's no story, but there is a sermon. You know, so, yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen anything out there like what Youth Group has to offer. Yeah, so, so does that, is that a challenge in that market, trying to fund a comedy? I mean, just any comedy? Is it, is it more difficult than if it were a more traditional drama? It appears to be. <laughs> well, now, I so you're, you're in talks with, uh, we won't mention any names, but I believe you do have some, some uh, fairly high-level interest in this project ongoing, and that's got to be encouraging to you. Uh, yes, very encouraging, very exciting. We actually have a dinner meeting with uh, somebody um, who's a name actor and his producing partner um, on January 22nd, and uh, they have expressed interest in wanting to help. So we're still early in the conversation. We had a conference call that went really well, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Well, if you know, if if people are out there who are interested, maybe who knows if that'll work out or something else does. But maybe there's an investor out there who this type of project strikes their fancy. What type of uh, what type of budget are you hoping for in your you know in your in your dreams? I mean, I'm assuming it's not going to I'm assuming it's not going to be a twenty million dollar movie. Oh, no, just nineteen. Well, well okay. Well, well, you're you're asking a very loaded question because different budgets have been thrown around. But well, it, right it, it, now, what's that? It depends on the talent and a lot of things. Right. It, you're, and and that's so true. It does depend on. Who are you getting as a talent? It depends on whether or not you're getting the locations at a great deal and, and all kinds of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, fortunately, we have a lot of people who really want to work on this project who um, are willing to help us out in the you know discounts and so forth. Well, let's so that's, it, that's really cool. That's really important. There's probably yes. not a lot of special effects in this movie, are there? No, but <laughs> believe it or not, though, there are some. At the end, no. there's actually... Snow is supposed to fall basically in California, so there's a snow effect at the end. <laughs> so, but uh, but anyway, um, but yeah, we shot the trailer. Um, and the, the trailer looks nice, by the way. I seen the whole pile thing at the end. I love that. Yeah, it's thank you. Yesterday. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was uh, that was fun. We shot that trailer, believe it or not, in one location. It was at a church in Southern California. And there's like seven different scenes there. We shot it all in one location in one 12 and a half hour day. And um, people really, really like the trailer. So we're uh, waiting for the people who can finance it who really, really like the trailer. So. Right, right. Well, it's a, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of an edgy comedy, I would say. I mean, it's not, yeah. I, don't mean, I don't mean edgy in the way that sometimes we use edgy to mean dirty. I don't mean that. Right. No, <laughs> but for the genre, it's not. Uh, it, it takes some chances, you know. And true. And I think that's sort of exciting, actually, for the genre. And if the if the faith based genre is going to grow, 
you know, somebody's going to have to be willing to take some. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. don't you don't you guys think it's think it's time for faith based films to kind of come out of the box? Yeah, yep. yes, absolutely. I mean, come on, let's I get think, real. <laughs> yeah, and be, and be human. Yeah, yes, I yep, totally absolutely. agree. And that's one of the things that I really like about this project is Thor Ramsey is an incredible screenwriter. He can do drama, he can do comedy, and this is genuinely funny. Yeah. So I, the quality is there. The trailer's hilarious. It really. It really Thank you. It, it uh, you know, it, if I had a million dollars to throw at you, I'd I'd throw part of it. So. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And if I had a nickel for every time somebody said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, "There you go, yeah, there you, you go," go. Uh, <laughs> you'd be going to a premiere right now. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, what are you telling Thor Ramsey here? No, or are you? What's going on in the shots? What? Oh, um, just so, just so you're aware, I don't see the images. I have a white screen in front of me, so I haven't seen you guys the entire conversation. Oh, that's oh. Yeah. So, so you'll have to narrate the photos. But that was just a that was just a goofy shot we did when we worked on the faith based short film yeah, uh, One Night Stand. Holding, holding up your hand, uh, saying yeah, stop or something. Well, let me do another one since you can't see. Uh, this is you with a bottle of wine. Oh no, that's not. It. <laughs> <laughs> this is that's on that martini shot out in uh, Palmdale or somewhere. I don't know. So out in the desert. Oh, is it a desert shot where I'm sitting in the director's chair? Yep. Yeah, that was our 2011 168 film project where we were wacky enough to do two <laughs> short films in 168 hours. Thankfully, they were both westerns and they were both in the same location, but we shot two shorts in two days. Uh, you you are a brave man. Yeah, you it was very chaotic. You mentioned it was very the, chaotic. You mentioned the 168 project a couple of times. Briefly tell people what that is because people may not know what you're talking sure. about. Sure. In a nutshell, it's a faith-based speed filmmaking competition where teams from around the world have a theme and a verse, and they springboard off of that theme and verse, and they have about 10 days to write a screenplay and to pre-produce and cast and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then they have literally 168 hours, hence the 168 mm -hmm. Film Project, to shoot, edit, and turn in a finished short film, and in our case, in 2011, two short films. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it, one great. of the things I love about it is it forces you to complete what you started. It's, it's a phenomenal challenge, and any aspiring filmmakers out there, I highly, highly recommend that you get involved in the 168 Film Project. You can go to their website, 168project.com. Okay, and we'll have we, that. And we were involved too, Tommy, in that 168 uh, in 2009. Okay. Um, it's a great program. We, in fact, we we actually used our short to help raise funding for Beyond the Farther Star. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I I have seen uh, some really excellent work out there. In fact, I wanted to get involved so much. I finally got in one of the projects last year. But there, you know, there just weren't that many in Central Texas. But it's a it's a great uh, program, and I was attracted to it because I saw some trailers. Uh, there was a film called Useless that won a bunch of awards a couple of years ago. That was done with the 168. And for you actors out there who are looking to build a reel, and you you know maybe you you don't have a lot of footage, things like the 168 or other short film projects where you can get uh, good footage on yourself that's real real acting work, not where you go to some place and they'll shoot you a demo, which always never looks all that good. Yeah. Uh, but get involved in a project like this and it can really, uh, really help you out to get a real. We actually have a question here uh, from Cindy Navarro wanting to know why it takes so long for independent films to get to theaters. And this is an you know sort of uh, an adjunct of what we already discussed, but now you're talking about what happens on the distribution end and how difficult it is to actually get a film a theatrical release as compared to maybe VOD or straight to DVD uh, can do anybody want to talk about you know what what the difficulties are in getting a well, theatrical release in the independent market getting uh, you know getting distribution is one of the hardest things I think independent filmmakers face uh, because it's that that process in which you want to obtain because you want to uh, return 
uh, payment on the investment made by your investors and your producers. Um, and it starts by getting a distribution rep or a person who will be that uh, middle person between you and the studios in which you are trying to get to acquire uh, your film. And that process can take weeks, months, years, to be honest with you. Um, and it's because there's different tiers of distribution companies. There's your top tier, like your Foxes and your Lions Gates and all of those guys. And then there's your second tier, your third and your fourth tier, which are your lower end distribution companies um, that you can submit your stuff to. Um, and it just takes a process. You know, it takes maybe four to six weeks for them to get back with you um, if they even get a chance to take a look at it within that time frame. Um, and so there's a lot of different, you know, hurry up and wait, as we like to call it in the film business, where you send this stuff out um, and you think, you know, the normal thing would be to get a response within, say, 75 hours. But in the film business, you know, you'll be lucky to get a response in two to three weeks. Uh, uh, and so it's really a, a strenuous process that you have to pitch and send your product out and have your distribution rep really talk to these companies and sell this film for you. And independent films have a hard time uh, because a lot of studios, like your big studios like Lionsgate and those different studios, uh, you know, kind of make it really hard uh, to acquire distribution on an independent level because a lot of times independent films don't have named actors. And they always mm -hmm. want to look for a film that has some kind of named actor in it because they feel like, okay, that adds some value. It doesn't matter... You know, a lot of times if it's shot on the red cam and, you know, you got the best cinematographer there is around, if you don't have known actors uh, who have some kind of name, they usually won't even look at it because they feel like there's no value. And then you have those things that they do look at and like, like, you know what, it may not have a name actor, but we really think it has a market. And they'll do something called a limited release. And a lot of movies um, do limited releases in theaters um, in, in different markets that they feel will, uh, you know, help that film prosper. And if it does really well in those markets, then it will do a nationwide release at that time. But of course, that takes a process um, in getting there. So it, it takes time because independent filmmakers just don't always have the budgets to get these big named actors. That's when you have uh, Miss Connor, who's doing your film, Benjamin, and myself, who's doing the film with Sean. When you have actors that are willing uh, to help out independent filmmakers, that really makes a difference, and it really pays off at the end of the day because it adds value to your production. Um, so that's the reason why it takes so long to get to that point. And then another thing too, it it takes a while because a lot of distributors won't even look at your project until it's finished. So you've got to do all the post work. You got to finish your project. You don't want it looking um, half baked. It has to be completed, and it has to look good. So a lot of that is just finishing the project, getting it done. You know, we started talking to distributors probably a year ago. And it just, you've got to find the right fit. You've got to find the right, uh, a lot of them, because you're independent, they can take advantage of you. So you've got to have people that, that you trust and they're in partnership with you to get your film out. And you know they're going to do everything that they can do to get your film out. And they believe in your project. Those are the distributors that you want. And they don't, they don't um, you know, pardon the expression, but rape you in the end yep. because they can. They will take a huge percentage because they're thinking these guys want to get their film out and you know they know that distribution is a difficult uh, it's a, just a difficult thing for independence so it takes time to develop those relationships it takes time to complete your film so it's ready enough for them to see it and then you know you want to you want the right partnership all of that takes a lot of time we're we're currently negotiating right now with a distributor and it's taken it's taken months the process it, it, it just like like uh, Lamarcus said it just takes a while for them to get back to you and to to uh, even though they like the project it takes yeah. them a while to get back and then there's contracts and and you know, there's all the other stuff that you have to consider it it just it uh, it can take months yes yeah it's uh, it's a laborious process and it's not for the faint of heart and it's not something that's going to happen quickly so people you know people on uh, every side need to understand that if you're a young filmmaker who th who thinks it's uh 
going to be uh, something short and sweet. I mean, I tell you, even just doing this hangout on air made me, <laughs> has made me appreciate how easy I have it as an actor. You know, I learn my st I learn my stuff. I show up. I do my part. If it's a few days or a few weeks, then I go home. You know, absolutely. But, but the producer and the director they're going to live with these projects for months and months and months. Getting yes, they do all the and forever. And we're working on projects even well before pre-production. Like right. I'm working yes. on a I'm working on a couple of short films. One with uh, my producing partner and co-writer Susan Shearer. It's called Familiar Spirits. Oh, good. Time. And we've been we've been working on that for a while now, getting the script toned down and and figuring stuff out. We have a table read coming up at CBS Studios Radford on the thirtieth of this month, January. I've and been there. Uh, what's that? I said I've been there. So so it just there's a, so much involved and and mm -hmm. uh, shout out to Susan Shearer. Hi Susan, you're I've doing a fabulous the, job on this project. Christopher, I've got the slide up for that. It's a really interesting looking. Uh, Graphic. Now, did she write this, or did you write it? Or are you attached as director? Or what's we we're, we both wrote it, and we are both producing it, and I'm directing it. Okay. And the and the basic story is: Can you give us a, a yeah? The basic snippet is: um, a grief-stricken woman uh, believes she's being visited by her uh, deceased daughter. Okay. And so it's it's really uh, following her journey into, you know, she really believes this is her daughter, but there are things that are awry about it, of course, and uh, and uh, some people around her, including her pastor and her sister, who really care for her and, and looking out for her, and, and she's just trapped in her despair and uh, so forth, and, and she wants to be left alone with her daughter. So this sounds like a departure for you because I most of the things I see uh, on the internet that you've been involved in are are comedic. I do tend to gravitate towards quirky comedies, but um, I do have dramatic chops as well. So, yeah, well, that's um, like a really interesting project. So thanks. When when is the reading again? Let's let people know. Uh, the the reading is at uh, CBS Studios Radford um, on January thirtieth. So now, this what, month. What is the purpose of the? Is it an investor read because it's on the studio? It's not. I assume it's right. Not, it's not open to the public. We actually, um, it it sort of is, but isn't. I mean, you have to sign up so your name can be on a list, and there is limited seating. Um, I think it seats a hundred, but uh, basically, it's multi purposes that w that we're doing it. Um, one, we want to record it so that we can have an audio trailer and storyboards to go with the audio mm -hmm. to help uh, raise the fundage for it because we're looking at roughly a twenty thousand dollar or so budget. And um, and you know that all that crew and actors and all that stuff, food that costs a lot of money, gas, all that you know, it's you guys know. Mm -hmm. So so there so we want to yep. do that. We also want to allow time for feedback, though. There there will be some industry professionals there. There will be just you know your average audience uh, there. So we want to get feedback. Um, see how did, did the script move you, what, what did you get from the script, that kind of thing, so we can um, take that and see what we need to do with the script, uh, because the actual production of this is a few months out, so, so yep. all, that, all that to say, I mean, you know, you guys were talking about even feature films take a long time, short films take a long mm -hmm. time, because yeah, you're, you're working on it well before pre-production. Um, I'm working on another short film that's a comedy, with uh, Brian McClure, who's an actor and producer, and he's writing the script, and it's a over-the-top comedy called Yeah Big Baby, and um, <laughs> and it's really fun. It, it's it's really it's really fun, and Brian's doing a great job on it. But but yeah, those are two projects that um, Familiar Spirits, which by the way, you can go to Facebook and see that it's a uh, uh, Familiar Spirits movie. So Facebook.com forward slash Familiar Spirits movie. Um, and don't be alarmed by the title; it is faith-based. <laughs> but um, but anyway, um, those I think the title is great. Oh, the title is fantastic. Yeah, it is. Thank now, you. Is it a feature or a short? It's a short. These are the the ones I'm talking about right now are both shorts. Um, okay. So we're looking at probably a three-day shoot on Familiar Spirits. Hey guys, but, 
we have some uh, questions on my website I want to throw out to you. But go ahead and finish your thought. I'm sorry I interrupted you. I was just saying that we've been working on those two um, just well before the pre-production stage from first talking about it, finding out what the story is and stuff. We've been working on that for months. So it, 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 it takes a long time. That's uh, that's called development, and when it goes on yes. longer, and longer and longer, sometimes it gets to be called development hell. But uh, not. not <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think we're there yet. You might want to ask Susan, but I, I don't think we're there yet. But um, <laughs> that usually happens when they bring in the second, third, fourth, and fifth writer. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then go back to the first writer. So, yeah, here here's a couple of questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, Tracy Trost. Hey, Tracy. I don't know if he's still watching, but filmmaker from Oklahoma. Uh, hey, Tracy. Terrific filmmaker. He says Oklahoma is good. I think he's probably talking about the incentives, but it's capped at $5 million and is being eaten up by big films coming in from the outside. The local guys like me are not able to use it. You know, that's, that, is, um, that is a problem, and some of the film incentive packages are geared toward the big budget uh, packages actually in Texas it's a little it's kind of the opposite and those of us who want the bigger budget films to come in have been um, upset a little bit because of the way the the package is structured the Texas package is a lot more advantageous to television and mm -hmm. somewhat smaller budgeted uh, projects because the the whole cap on the amount of uh, money that's available is nowhere near what you one big budget film would take the whole the whole uh, film incentive package. So, well, and and TXMPA, I think right now is working on raising that uh, that limit so that we can have yeah, uh, bigger yeah, budgets. Absolutely, they're they're coming to the legislature. Our legislature meets every two years, and so this gets revisited every two years. Every two years, unfortunately, it's like we go back to nothing and have to win it again, and it's mm. very stressful, quite frankly. Uh, yeah. Texas. Texas had a tremendous amount of production and let it slip away, and it's hard to get it back now. But the TXMPA, uh, Texas Motion Picture Association, is working tirelessly to do that. In fact, we have a big uh, fundraiser and thing with the SAG Awards coming up in a couple of weeks. But let's see if there's some other questions. LaMarcus, what is, uh, this is from Dion Kearney. LaMarcus, what is some advice you could give to a young up-and-coming actors to be successful? Well, that's a... That's, a pretty, that's, a, that's a, if you can do that in thirty words or less, you're a, you're a, you're a good man. But I, pretty broad question. Um, I, I, first, uh, a very broad question. But uh, one of the most important things is first thing is to surround yourself with individuals who share the same goals and aspirations as as you. Um, I do believe that a lot of people who have dreams to be filmmakers. They don't surround themselves by around other filmmakers. And so that can sometimes um, hold you back as far as uh, prospering in your career. It's just keep the same company uh, that has the same goals and aspirations as you. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is find a great agent who believes in you, um, who is willing to work for you and help develop you as an actor. Um, and, I, and I say be a part of many things as possible. Do stage plays, do short films, be an extra. Um, do whatever you can to be around production and just be a sponge and soak it up. Um, and if it's meant for you, you will have it. Uh, but in order for be, to be in the right place at the right time, you have to put the work in um, and be present. So just, just keep, the, keep that going and you'll be okay. That is great advice. It was. And yep. make friends with producers and directors. <laughs> there you oh, go. yes. That yeah. doesn't, it doesn't hurt. Yeah, that gonna, helps. I'm going to recommend a, a book if, if the, uh, this person is a young actor. There's a terrific uh, book that I want to recommend to you. I had the great privilege of interviewing a writer, actor uh, named uh, Marcus Flanagan from out in California. And he has a terrific book called One Less Bitter Actor. And mm -hmm. it is – if. If I had had this book 30 years ago, it would have saved me a lot of heartache because it covers a lot of things that actors need to know. And I think the uh, the chapter on auditioning alone is worth more than the price of the book. So check that out, One Less Bitter Actor by Marcus Flanagan. It's a terrific book. He's a very experienced actor, and he comes from it from a point of wanting to help actors you know, maintain uh, – their love for the business and not get embittered. Nobody wants to be around a bitter person 
whether it's an no. actor or anybody. Oh, no, not at hey, all. Hey, Tommy. No, yeah. no, no. Hey, hey, Tommy. How many actors does it take to screw in a light bulb? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I don't know. A hundred. One to screw it in, and ninety-nine to stand back and say, "I could have done that better." <laughs> yeah, exactly. I yep. love that. There you go. Let's see. Uh, another question here, Ben. What was the most rewarding part of your role as producer on Beyond the Farthest Star so far? Oh wow. Um, I guess probably the relationships that were made, and and really seeing the film um, start from you know just a story on the page to now being this really great product that I think is going to be amazing and people are going to really be captivated and compelled by it um, and it's going to be on screens. I think that's the most rewarding part is that I had a hand in that to uh, take it from, from a concept to reality and to see it up on screen. Cool. We have a, we're going to have to wrap this up. I've held, held you guys for, for too long, but I really appreciate it. But I do want to get these questions in because people were, were kind enough to uh, submit them. Here's a question from Cynthia Tucker, and this might be a little bit broad as well, but maybe LaMarcus or any of you guys probably have some, some advice to give her. She says, I want to create a TV series bringing Bible stories to life. I have no background in film or TV at all. What do you suggest for me to begin learning the industry? How to hire directors, actors, raise money, uh, know how to how much money I need. Uh, I want to do wow, okay. I want to do the complete Bible as it's never been done before. So I'm imagining ten seasons or so. Well, it it sounds like a really really ambitious project. And my advice would be first of all to focus in maybe on on a place to start. But would any of you guys have any uh, advice for someone who just has no experience. You've got to start somewhere and get some experience would be the thing. How would somebody go? Um, well, I would say just just in order to put yourself around um, individuals that are film filmmakers, uh, there's things that we do called film mixers where different filmmakers and things of that nature in the community and in the surrounding cities will come together. I know Austin is a great place uh, where filmmakers are. Uh, where they do film mixers almost every weekend and all these filmmakers get together and you go and you introduce yourself you speak to some of them find out what their strengths are um, and explain what you're trying to do and really um, listen to them and read their body language to so make sure these are people that are really going to support you and not try to take advantage of you as Benjamin was saying earlier in regards to another topic so uh, it goes back to kind of surrounding yourself with individuals who have that knowledge now in regards to you wanting to uh, get that knowledge yourself, um, I would definitely say get on Google um, and look up film productions in the past. I mean, a lot of things are on websites now, um, especially if you want to learn like what the positions are and what they what their what their job duties are, and really educate yourself on that so that before you go to this mixer, you know what a UPM is, what a grip is, what a gaffer is, what a DP is. Uh, what a producer, what a line producer is, um, and you know all of these things ahead of time before you go in so you know exactly what to look for. And then to go back to your uh, uh, point, Tommy, is I would say definitely focus in on where you want to start in it. Because you're doing the Bible, I would assume that you're going to start with Genesis, and I would say start there first. So when you go into the mixer, uh, go in just saying, you know, I definitely want to do the rest of the Bible, but first and foremost, my first uh, topic is going to be Genesis, and focus all your attention on that. Start with that one thing, and then once you accomplish that, then you start talking about the rest of the Bible all the way through to Revelation. Um, so take it one step at a time, educate yourself before you go to this mixer, and go to and go to the mixer and make yourself available for other filmmakers so you guys can meet and talk and work and, for the, and there are a ton of resources like LaMarcus said there's a ton of resources out there that she could probably learn more about the business learn how there, there's a lot of resources that, that kind of take you from the beginnings of a project to the end of a project so she can kind of understand how it all uh, comes together there's a lot of parts and pieces that uh, she probably needs to understand because you know gosh it's a lot of work 
it is a yeah, lot is. of work, and that she needs to understand the sacrifices. People don't realize that they think it's just you know writing a little story and boom, it, it it's it's made into a film. It it doesn't doesn't normally happen like that. It it takes a lot of time and years, and you've got to be willing to sacrifice and put those years into it. Yes. And yep. another practical thing. I'm sorry, did I cut somebody no, off? No, go ahead. No. I was just going to say another practical thing, if you're the one planning on writing it, definitely learn screenwriting format, at least the basics, because a lot of people won't even look at your script if it isn't even in, in the right format. So I would, recommend, I would recommend something like Final Draft or something like that that does a lot of the hard stuff for you with the margins and everything, but definitely learn screenwriting format. What I did a few years ago, I took a a screenwriting uh, class at a at a JC, uh, a junior college. So uh, take a screenwriting class and yeah. learn the basics there. And That's always, good. I would I would say um, I love that idea. And always, but never tune out different options. If you can't do it one way, look for another way. Look for if you could if you could create a coloring book throughout the whole you know the whole Bible, or or find a way if you could find an illustrator or anyone who could draw up it and make it a cartoon. I always look for different ways. Um, to 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 get your idea across, don't just look for one option. That's that's really good advice. You you know, a lot of times in uh, filmmaking or creating creative projects or anything else in life, you sometimes you have to punt. Yeah. You know, yes. <laughs> you, have to punt. you may have to come at it at a different direction, but if your commitment is there and you really believe in your project, hopefully it will work out. The project that she was mentioning, I mean, the, the scope of it sounds enormous, and for me, it would be daunting to think of it in those terms. I would have to break it down into, into smaller chunks and work on a smaller chunk, at, you know, at one time and accomplish that, and then and then keep going. But it's you know, it was, certainly would be an, an interesting an interesting project. Um, one other question, Kathy Lonziger uh, asks a great question. This is really for uh, Lamarcus primarily and uh, Sean. With the time stretch, waiting for production and uh, fundraising factors and all that, how do you deal with an aging child actress? Did you guys have a problem with that? The issue the, with that in Down by the River. The way oh. we uh, w the way we fixed that problem was you always shoot any kid that's growing up first. Get yes. all of that because mainly what independent filmmakers do we shoot out of sequence, and the reason we do that is because it's cost effective. You know you can't. If you're going to shoot, you know, four bedroom scenes, you don't want to shoot every single day. You want to do those all in one day if you can. And um, you always look at the primary factor, and that's the kid. The kid is always growing. And, it's, and, and Adriana, she was growing rapidly. And so yes. what we had to do was we had to shoot her, you know, within those first two weeks. So if we had to do pickup shots, we would do everything second to her because you never want that child to start growing. And the second thing, um, when you're working with a, uh, I wanted to mention this earlier. Make sure you you know the the laws that it, that it, it requires when you're working with a child actor because you don't want to work a child actor, you know, over a certain amount of hours. Or yes. You don't want to do anything like that because you can get yourself into, you know, a deep ditch. And that's, that's right. one thing that we was very very keen on, you know, working with that actor and making sure we get her as quick as possible, the safest way, and the most. Um, the most, you know, that, that that's under the law. Yeah, obviously, if you're working with underage actors, you have child labor laws to deal with. Uh, depending on where you cast, even uh, if you cast an L.A. child actor, let's say, and they're shooting in Texas, I believe the L.A. rules would apply to that actor, even though they're shooting in Texas. Yeah. You really, you really have to know what you're doing, or you can uh, you can get in trouble. You know, so there may, be, there may be on on set schooling involved and all sorts of things. So it's um, you, you know you really want to you really want to think about uh, a project that has a child actor in it or, or animals, as they say. Yeah. You know, because those things can get really really expensive. Guys, uh, I'm gonna uh, sort of wrap it up here because we've been on quite a while, and I, I don't want to abuse your time, but um, give each of you the opportunity to add anything that you. That we didn't get to touch on about your projects or about indie filmmaking that you want to make sure you make a point that that you had hoped to make. Um, uh, ben, I guess I can start start on the end with you. If there's anything uh, you want to offer, if not, then uh, that's okay too. 
Yeah, you know, um, one of the things that I, I think that um, I think we've all kind of talked about faith-based films, and I know on our Facebook uh, page, it's it's where we communicate with our fans constantly. And uh, one of the things that, that people have asked quite a bit were, was the the fact that why is Beyond the Farthest Star faith-based? And and really, I guess it's for lack of a it, there's not really a, a better way to describe it because there is faith in the story. Um, it's not a church movie. It's not. Um, it's a very different type of film. And you know, we I guess we need to come up with a better um, genre name for uh, what we're doing here because um, it's a, still a universal story, and I think it's a story that everyone can relate with. But um, I want to get that 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 uh, thought out there because a lot of people have asked us about it and we haven't really been able to explain it <laughs> in depth um, on the Facebook account but uh, but yeah that's one of the things I think that that's important and we're just excited about uh, that we're coming out this year just please you guys keep watching Facebook we're going to things are going to start changing rapidly as we start releasing the film and everything's going to come together and like I said in the next few weeks we'll uh, release a countdown um, to the trailer, and then, um, of course, we'll start announcing all the dates. The website was gonna is gonna change completely. We'll have a new look and a new feel, and it's and it's very exciting. We're very excited about it. Very good, uh, Christopher. Any anything that I uh, failed to to talk about that that you wanted to mention or? Yeah, just uh, some uh, basically some Facebook pages. Um, the youth group Facebook page is a uh, youth group feature film. Or no, I think it's youth group movie. Sorry, youth group movie. I'll tell you, one any, of the two. Any links? Don't worry about you know making sure that because what's going to happen, guys, for the audience too. Once the once this hangout on air ends, it actually gets automatically uploaded by Google to YouTube, and I'll probably pull it down and maybe put a front end on it so it looks nicer. But then it will live on YouTube and also on ActorsTalkPodcast.com. Uh, in a week or so, my next episode will be up, and I will make this an audio episode of the Actors Talk podcast, and I will have a uh, blog post going with that that will have all the links to all of these projects right there where you can go to actorstalkpodcast.com and find the links uh, that you can go to each one of these uh, Facebook pages or websites or anything for each of uh, each of you gentlemen. Okay, so people okay. will be able to find all those links after we're done here. They don't need to try and write it down now. Or Got it. Okay. So. Well, thank you for that, Tommy. So um, so check out the One Nightstand. That's two words, One Nightstand uh, trailer, which is a soon-to-be-released short that um, I did with producer-writer Gary Emmerich, and Thor Ramsey was also the star. Um, uh, check out the Familiar Spirits um, Facebook page. Check out the Youth Group trailer. Uh, which is, again, a trailer that we shot to envision people as to what the movie could look like. That movie is not shot yet. Please help. And um, and then just be on the lookout for other uh, wacky comedies and dramas here and there. There you go, Christopher. Thank you. LaMarcus? Um, I would say a very one of the most important, if not the most important thing that we've mentioned tonight is making sure you have a great support system uh, when you get ready to take this journey as a filmmaker uh, because you cannot do it alone uh, by any means uh, can you do this by yourself then you need to surround yourself with like-minded individuals who are going towards the same goal because there's going to be many days and many nights where you're frustrated or you want to give up or you feel like there is no light at the end of the tunnel and you need that brother or that mother or that friend uh, to lift you up and support you and let you know that it is going to get better and that you can do this, uh, you know, because for every blessing there's a sacrifice. And in this business, you make a lot of sacrifices, uh, especially with your time and with family functions and friends and things of that nature. So if you surround yourself by like-minded individuals, it will make the process a lot easier um, because they will be there for you uh, in the tough times and in the good times. So definitely uh, keep your head up and you know have faith and know that anything is possible as long as you put the work in uh, one of my favorite scriptures that I'll leave you with is faith without works is dead um, you have to put in the work in order for God to do the rest and, and water those mm. seeds so that you can reap an amazing harvest um, and, I'll, 
then I'll leave you all with that and just continue to watch uh, Tommy's uh, Actors Talk podcast. We're really honored to be here. Continue to keep an eye out on 400's Facebook page and our Twitter. And also, please go visit our Indiegogo page and support us um, in making this project that's really important for independent filmmakers. Um, so we just thank you and uh, just keep the faith and uh, keep believing. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Does, does anyone, That's good. Before I get to Sean, I'll give you the last word of the panel, Sean. Does anyone else have a have a crowdfunding page that you want to point people to here during the live broadcast? I know 400 does. It's, it's Indiegogo, right, guys? Indiegogo.com, yeah. Backslash 400. Okay. Anybody else uh, have a project that's on a crowdfunding page? There's some very interesting things, by the way, filmmakers, going on in the crowdfunding market where the rules have changed where there will be some different kinds of investments possible through crowdfunding going forward. So you want to check check with your tax attorney and your entertainment attorney because there may be some opportunities there. Uh, Sean, did you have anything uh, to add? Well, um, I think I think all these gentlemen summed it up. You know, I, um, I do want to thank every independent um, um, filmmaker. You know, for keep going. You know, keep keep doing what you do. Um, never stop. You know, if if it's something. Filmmaking, I think filmmaking is a part of is a, is a part of life. It's a, it's a way of life, and if you, you you keep you know having the same thoughts over and over, and, and filmmaking is on your mind every second, and continue to do it, and God bless you in all your endeavors. And for every fan that you know supports indep independent filmmaking, we appreciate that. We truly, truly do, because I know we did some 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 um, some theaters, and, and we you know funded it ourselves, and every one of them was a sold out show. And that's just tremendous to see people, you know, support independent filmmaking without any commercials on TV or any, you know, million dollar budgets. And that brings joy to us to know that people do care and people are watching. And, you know, any way that you can just help, you know, help and, and keep giving and keep supporting it. You know, we definitely appreciate it. We do feel the love. And I'm honored to be a part of this, this panel with these, all these great gentlemen. And I wish all you guys the best. And I wish to see you soon. And I wanted to say, Tommy, um, thank you so much for having us on your show. Um, I'm such a fan, man. I love what you're doing. I love everything about it. Um, I'm, I'm just honored and humbled to even be here with you guys and to be in you guys' presence. So thank you very much for doing this for us. And yes, thank you, it. Tommy. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you yes, very much. Ditto on that. That's uh, We just Absolutely. appreciate you, Tommy, and everything you're doing to bring filmmakers in, uh, to the forefront and acting. I mean, people need to know this stuff, and uh, we really appreciate that. Hey, guys, thanks. Let me say a couple of words to the audience, and then hang. you guys hang in. Don't, don't log off yet, because once we end the broadcast, I want to just give you a, a goodbye, a proper goodbye. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you so much. If, if you're out there watching live, or if sometime into the future now you find this video on YouTube, thank you for doing that. And I want to thank the panel. Benjamin Dane and Christopher Sean Shaw, whose name I didn't mess up once. You know, I didn't call you Christopher Shawshank Redemption, not one time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, Sean, thank you so much. You're, you're a, a terrific guy. I really appreciate it. I've interviewed you twice now. And the thing that comes through to me about all these guys is the, that they are genuinely terrific people passionate about what they're doing, passionate about their work. Now, for you people out there who are not uh, faith-based people, I hope that you have gotten a glimpse of the kind of projects that people of faith can do that aren't necessarily tied to be preachy sermonettes or something. The information that's been presented here tonight goes for your project, whether it's a secular project or a faith-based project. And I want to hopefully, hopefully you've been given something you can... Uh, and take value in. So thank you so much. And thank you to each of the panel members. And that's it. We're going to end this broadcast, the very first Actors Talk podcast, Hangout on Air. Thank you for being here. Tommy G. Over Kerr. and out. Over and out. <laughs> You've been waiting the whole time to say that, haven't you? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. <laughs> there you go. Let me give you your, your moment there. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll end the broadcast.